We begin our program this evening with uh, Bob Shop. Bob is currently the president of the Denver South Park and Pacific Historic Society and vice president of the South Park Rail Society. Bob also serves as a board member of the South Park National Heritage Area and the Park County Historical Preservation Advisory Commission. So you'd expect this guy to be a retired Navy pilot, retired airline pilot, and a never to be retired rail fan. Bob, we very much appreciate your being with us. So bring us up to date on what you're planning this summer in Como. Okay, everybody, thank you for inviting me to talk about Como, my, my favorite topic to talk about. Uh, the Denver South Park and Pacific Historical Society, and in conjunction with the South Park Rail Society, two 501c3s, our signature project, in addition to just trying to preserve the history and disseminate all information, everything from modeling to historical facts, is to restore the Como rail yards. Okay, why is this not advancing? Just click on the slide, Bob. It should advance if you click right on the slide. There we go. Go. You okay. The railroad with too many names. 1872 was incorporated, and up until 1889, it was the Denver South Park and Pacific Railroad. And for a while, it was known when the Union Pacific owned it in the 1880s as the Colorado Division of the Union Pacific. It arrived in Como in June of 1879. It was reorganized in 1889 as the Denver, Leadville, and Gunnison held that title for about 10 years. And then finally became in December of 1898, the Colorado and Southern. The narrow gauge part in the South Park uh, lasted until 1937 when it was finally abandoned. It held that corporate name, although, and it was bought by the Burlington in 1906 and it held the corporate name until 1982. But through all of that, it was always known as the South Park line. A quick map of where they went. The uh, amber up in the top there was the Colorado Central, which became part of the Colorado and Southern when that was incorporated. And initially it went through Como and Como was just a stop along the line on their way to Gunnison. And they said, and Pacific, but realistically, I don't know if they even expected that back then. They got as far as Baldwin, the coal mines of Baldwin, and that's as far as they got. And two years after it arrived in Como in 1879, they decided to build their own, what became known as the High Line to Leadville up over Boreas Pass, down through Breckenridge, Dillon, Frisco, up to 10 mile to Fremont Pass where the Climax Mine was and then down to Leadville. And that was pretty much the whole system, just over 300 miles of track. This is the earliest known photo of Como in 1883. Uh, this is from a cabinet card by George Mellon. And over here is a Mason Bogey 266. This was the first hotel in Como, the Gilman Hotel opened New Year's Day of 1881. The following year, they added this extension onto it. And in those early days, the depot, which still exists today, was connected to it. A few years later in 1885, the Pacific Hotel Company, which was kind of a smaller version of the Harvey houses with the Santa Fe, but these were with the Union Pacific. They had, uh, I think, 22 eating houses and hotels along the line. Most of them were along the standard gauge, only two were on the narrow gauge, and the other one was on the Utah Northern. Over here is the original water tank, the first of four designs that were there. This one has the enclosed stone base. The second one had an enclosed wooden base. And the third one, the most famous and longest lasting one, had an open wood frame base with a frost box in the middle. And that's the one we're trying to recreate. I'll show you more about that later. And here's the original um, stone roundhouse, six stalls. Later on in the late 80s and early 90s, they added 13 more stalls. And I actually had over a half circle around the roundhouse here. And let's see, that happened in 1881 when they decided to build from Como, making it, if you would, graduating from a stop along the line to a major junction point. And they built this roundhouse so they could do uh, major locomotive work. Today, there are three remaining structures when the railroad shut down in 1937, the original six stall roundhouse, the depot and the newer hotel, which I'll show you in a bit. Fast forward to the last train when the courts finally approved uh, the abandonment of the railroad they've been trying to shut down for many years. April 10th, 1937, this is a very famous photo of the last passenger train from Leadville back to Denver. It wasn't actually the last train, the last revenue train was a freight the next day, April 11th, but 
no pictures of that. Anyway, the railroad sat idle for the rest of the year, just a few equipment moves. And then in 1938, they started pulling the rails up. The roundhouse restoration began in 1980. Here's a before and after. Bill Kazel and his son, Greg, bought the property around 1980 and started restoring it. And they did stonework. As you can see, it was in pretty bad shape. They rebuilt the doors. They built an entire new roof on the place because half of it had collapsed by the time they started and replaced all the windows, which, which were all gone by the time they started. Here's what it looks like today. Then the South Park and Pacific Historical Society was created by Cliff Mustel in 1998. You probably know him from all the conventions. The Como Depot restoration, this is when I got involved, began in 2008. Here's a before and after of the depot. And the punchline today is, all I wanted to do, all we wanted to do at the time was keep it from falling over and holy cow, look where we're at today. So it took about seven years, a little over $400,000, but worth every bit of it today. It's a museum. Here's a picture of some of the artifacts and display cases in the waiting room. We have other display cases full of artifacts. The Como Hotel restoration began in 2009 and it's kind of on hold at the moment, but it is continuing. Here's a nifty kind of then and now photograph. The Gilman Hotel, which became the Pacific Hotel again in 1885, burned down in November of 1896. And uh, the reason the depot survived was in 1885 when they did that, when they finished it, they moved the hotel about 15 feet to the south. So it wasn't connected anymore. We think they did it because the hotel was brick and the depot was wood and they may have been afraid of the depot catching fire and burning down the hotel. When actually, or ironically, the exact opposite is what happened. Uh, fire started in the kitchen of the hotel and burned it to the ground the following year, 1897. They built today's hotel. Uh, it was painted white after uh, the railroad left town in the early 1940s. And the joke in Como today is the white paint is holding it up. Uh, Maybe some truth to that. 2017, our sister organization, the South Park Rail Society, was created. And it's kind of a, a joint effort. Uh, well, it is. The South Park, Denver South Park and Pacific Society uh, is responsible mainly for the Como Depot and track laying. South Park Rail Society is mainly for responsible for the roundhouse and the locomotive and rolling stock. And it's a very synergistic effort, if you will. In this case, uh, two and two is equaling five. There's been talk about combining them, but for now, we're going with the old saying, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. It's working and we're gonna keep it going that way. This is the key to our success, the volunteer corps. We have probably 75 active volunteers on any given workday in the summertime. Uh, we have 20 to 25. We've had as many as 40 on any given day. We're very big on safety and training. We provide hard hats, gloves, and the, uh, the safety vests. And we do provide a very nice lunch for everybody. Here's Norm Acker uh, finishing up on the, the gondola 4319. So a lot of car restoration going on. And track lane, this is north of the hotel. This would have been the old main line to Leadville. So far we've laid about 4,700 feet of track and we're looking forward to this summer, we'll lay a lot more. Here's what makes it work, grants, donations, and again, the volunteers. Here's a quick uh, slide of the principal organizations that have given us grants, making all this possible. And here's our pride and joy, now labeled as DSP and P number four. This was a 1912 Baldwin Prairie type 262, built for the Klondike Mines Railway in Yukon Territory, Canada. They bought it brand new, but only used it for a couple of years. Nothing wrong with the locomotive. The mine went bust, just played out. It wasn't what they thought it was. It sat in the weeds there till World War II, and the government grabbed it, put it on the White Pass in Yukon to haul material, help haul materials from the deep water port of Skagway up to Yukon territory, uh, Whitehorse, the end of the line. And the army was building the old Can Highway in both directions out of Whitehorse. They used it into the 1950s and then they were done with it. And it was brought down to the lower 48 and bounced around literally half a dozen different little operations like ours. Some used it, some did not. In 2014, the Georgetown Loop Railroad acquired it, but they never did steam it. 
and in 2017, we acquired it and brought it to Como. And when she runs, you can tell nobody's interested. This is an important picture. Last winter and this winter, you're probably aware in July of 2021, we were firing it up for the first time in a couple of years because of COVID and a little wedge in the uh, crosshead broke. So the piston rod was no longer connected to it. The piston shot forward, pulverized the front cylinder head. And long story short, that low point turned into a blessing in disguise. We started digging into the locomotive and found out that it really needed a lot. And today and all through last winter and this winter, and if you guys have ever been to Como in the wintertime or driving past it, you know it's a frozen hill in the wintertime. Uh, but these guys are rebuilding the locomotive, the front tube sheet, new tubes, reboard the cylinders, and, and all kinds of other things are happening. We do expect, we're optimistic it'll be done early this summer and should be running for our big open house, Boris Pass Railroad Day, which is the third week in August, and a couple of weeks later for the convention. Uh, this is a garden of stone, as I call it. These are actual CNS markers, but they were from the main line down in Denver that went up to Cheyenne. Here's a picture of the round of today. Uh, someday, we hope to reinstall the wood flooring. Here's a little piece of it here. There's a few other pieces. Those were three inches thick, 12 by 12 inch planks. Uh, so that's going to be a major job. We'll probably do it one stall at a time, but to keep down the dust in the cinders, it would turn everything and everyone black. We covered the floor in stone. Gash pit excavation prior to restoration. Uh, we'll be laying track over that this summer. Just to the right over here was where the coal dock was. I put this second picture of our volunteers up because it shows Kathy Brannigan, that Klondike Kate is named after, and her husband, Dr. Charles Brannigan, he's a retired vascular surgeon. They own the roundhouse and the locomotive. The hotel is owned by David Tompkins. Two biggest challenges, not surprising, financing. We've been doing very well and it's worked out to a nice balance. The money that we acquired to move forward uh, seems to balance out with the available manpower to get things done. And the number one priority, I say this tongue in cheek, but I'm serious at the same time, Hurting the cats, I'm sure you're all aware, many organizations have started out with the greatest of intentions, most sincere intentions, but egos get in the way, personality conflicts, the next thing you know, what happened to those guys? They're, they're not around anymore. We've had some issues, but we're very careful about going out of our way to make sure everybody gets along and contributes. And so far, we're doing well. A few more Como successes. This is the pit and what would have been in the uh, wooden stalls, pit number seven or track number seven. The one next to it over here is track number eight. We hope to finish that this summer. We will lay track over both of these again. And you can see the odd angle up here off the turntable. This was a curved track off the turntable going into this bay. And this was the bay that held the rotary. It was extended. In 1923, they dismantled most of the wooden stalls and they left up three, which would have been bay seven, eight, and nine. They burned down in 1935 and were never rebuilt. Here's a before and after, a little confusing. Or I should have put a border in here, but this is the turntable before we started working on it. And here it is right after we finished it. Today it has decking on it. And that's an interesting story. I could talk for 30 minutes about how that came to be. Boxcar 608, this is a treasure. This is an 1879 Litchfield card machinery works in Litchfield, Illinois, uh, part of a, a group of, I think, 150 at the time boxcars. This was number 608. And it ended up on the ground. It ended up on the Denver, Boulder, and Western. And just outside of Netherland is the tiny town of Cardinal. And when it finished its career, that's where it ended up on the ground. And we acquired it when a new property owner said, get it out of here, it'll disappear. So you can see how rough it was. We have restored one end and one side. The lettering will be done this summer. Uh, the other side and the other end, we did not restore. All we did was put in wood where it was missing. And the reason we didn't restore the other side is, you can't see it here, it's actually the side I can't see here. The original DSP and PRR lettering from 1879 is still visible and we didn't want to cover it up or lose it. So we won't be using this in a train or anything. This is just a static display. We are gonna put a coupler pocket under here, Lincoln pin. 
CNS 4319, it's the last known narrow gauge Colorado and Southern uh, gondola. It's been in Central City for many decades. And we asked them if we could bring it down to Como and restore it, which we did. It's an operational restoration. The brakes work. We'll be using this behind Klondike Cape. And it was used in, uh, back in the 70s when the Colorado Central was running again for that short stretch. And they put a door in it for people to get in and out. You can see here where it used to be. We put new boards in there. Um, anyway, it came out beautiful. And you'll see that in a train, possibly on September 2nd, when we have the open house for the convention. Membership's currently around 100, 325. It varies from time to time. It's increased many times. I was an original member in 1999. We had all of a dozen people. So we've been doing very well. Uh, I think because we have a good reputation, uh, we have a nice track record of when we get money for a project, we see it through to a completion. We have a website. Um, the Como project is our signature project now. For his past railroad days is every year in the third um, Saturday in August, we have our big open house. This year we'll kind of have two of them with the convention. And spreading the good word like I'm doing right now from my bully pulpit on little events like this. And occasionally we do bigger events. Uh, advertising the usual things. Facebook flyers are printed up every year. The newspapers, the Fair Play Flume loves us. They, they run several articles a year. We are going to have more open houses. Um, the third Saturday in June, July, August, and September now, we'll have an open house for the public as well as September 2nd for the convention. This is our uh, kind of our flagship publication, The Bogies in the Loop. And those of you who may not be familiar with this railroad probably wondering where do we get a weird name like that? It's named after two icons of the South Park line, the Mason Bogies that they had and the Georgetown Loop. Been doing this for 24 years now. And some things we have down the road coming up, rebuilding the water tank. This was the last one that was there. It only lasted a couple of years. Uh, the flat top tank from the 20s and 30s was replaced in 1935, and they only used it for a couple of years when they finally got permission to abandon the line in 37. And I hope this works. Here's a stop action. One day when we were putting up the verticals and some of the, uh, the horizontal beams underneath the floor. The concrete base that we're building this on is original to the 1935 replacement tank. All the three tanks before that were just basically sitting on the ground. Here's what it looks like at the moment. And the, the contractors who are building this for us um, have been cutting three by six boards, which will be the floorboards and the roof boards as well as the side staves. So you'll see a lot of progress on that this summer. You should see quite a difference September 2nd if you're able to make it. This is an interesting picture. January 1929, boxcar 8179. It's uh, kind of rare that a boxcar we've obtained in our restoring that we'd actually have a picture of it in Como. This was taken from the second floor of the Como Hotel. And here it is today. 8179 was one of the Victor Miller cars that the CNS sold when they shut down to the RGS. And after the RGS shut down, many of the cars ended up on ranches. And that's where this one came from, the backyard of a ranch in uh, just north of Montrose. And we'll be starting on that this spring. 8027, Jason Midyet restored that. And 8311, this was the car that was up on Boreas Pass for 18 years. It looked beautiful when they hold it up there. And this is what the Boreas Pass winds in the winter do to a car. Uh, we've sanded it. We've already got the first coat of red on it. And we'll be pulling it into the uh, roundhouse this summer, putting the final coat of red on it, as well as the lettering. It will be going back up to Boreas Pass in 2025. That's the deal we made with the Forest Service. This is Scott Francis out in St. Louis. He's recreating a South Park legend, uh, the South Park Zephyr. Here's an original picture of it, 1938. And the deal with this thing was, as the track set empty in late 37 and early 38, three citizens of Como, um, it was 
John Redesall and brothers Claire and Jean Dugan uh, acquired a, a Model T and converted it to a three foot gauge in the stone round or the stone garage, which is just to the right of this picture. And they painted the V1 half one there as a joke because, of course, it has a flathead four cylinder and Ford had just come out with a V8. So they thought they would put the V1 half one there kind of as a joke. The original car is long gone. Nobody knows what's happened to it, but we're going to recreate that. There's another original picture of it up on uh, Boreas Pass in 1938. And they went all the way up to Fremont Pass. They tried to go to Leadville, but uh, uh, John wrote an article in a 1985 edition of Model T Ford magazine. And he wrote an article basically telling how they did this and what, how they had fun with it. And the Climax mine had already covered the tracks just this side of Fremont Pass where Robinson is. And today it's very deep, of course, but uh, they got that far. There's a picture of it at the Kokomo Depot and they went down the Platte Canyon and they went up the Alma branch through Fair Play to Alma. They had a lot of fun with this. Caboose 1008, you guys probably heard about this. It's in uh, Northridge, California. It was discovered in Pasadena, California, quite by accident. Richard Farmer and his brother Bob live in Northridge. Or Bob lives in, in Phoenix, actually. And he got a phone call from a realtor friend of his, and he said, uh, someone passed away. His property's being sold. There's an old caboose in the backyard. It's got to go. Will you take a look at it, see if anybody wants it or if you want it? And he thought for sure it would be an old Southern Pacific caboose. And his eyes kind of popped out when he saw it. He brought it back to his house and they are doing a literal Smithsonian level operational restoration on this car. Here's a picture of the new frame they built because the old one was kind of too far gone. They gave it to us and it's now in the Como Roundhouse on display. And they are reassembling it right now. And I don't know when, but he assured me Como will see this car again. We're also restoring uh, DNRG stock car for 5743. Uh, we got this from the Tacoma siding on the Durango and Silverton. And of course, it's not really germane to this railroad, but we know for a fact that DNRG stock cars did go through Como occasionally. Uh, this picture is here because this is stall seven, eight, and nine of the uh, roundhouse, and we plan to recreate these three stalls. We're still working on getting permission to rebuild this trestle. And we don't need re permission to rebuild it because our property ends right here. But Park County owns from here, half a mile or so up to the King Y. That's as far as we hope to go. And we may or may not rebuild the trestle if they won't let us do it because you're going downhill on almost a 4% grade. And we, I don't know if it's worth building that trestle, but we may, we may build it. We hope to rebuild it and go up to the King Y. That would give us about a one mile run uh, and that's about as far as we can go without crossing any roads, which we don't ever intend to do. Here's an aerial photo, the turntable, the roundhouse, the water tank. This is before it was put up, but it, it's going up right here in the original location. And this is the uh, Gunnison Main, which today goes down past the bottom of the picture here. There's the depot, there's the hotel. We've got track built up to about here. And this is the line that went to Denver. This is where the trestle would be rebuilt and it goes up the other side of the King Y. And here's a map that shows it even better. We hope to get to the King Y and with just enough of a tail uh, to turn a short train. And that would mean we could, again, run about one mile and be able to turn the engine at both ends, turn table at this end and the Y at this end. This is our big deal again, third Saturday every August. Uh, this speeder is a 1952 Fairmont speeder that was actually built for the Tacoma power plant on the DNS. And we have one of our volunteers as a speeder. So we'll be running those in the open houses as well as the hand car. Kids love to push the locomotive around. And it's amazing how that thing glides with the bearing that's underneath it. It's an old Denver Rio Grande bearing that came from a mining spur out near Paonia. And even with the locomotive on it, one person can actually push that thing. You got to really put your back into it to get it going. And you really got to dig your feet in to get it stopped. And once it gets moving, it just glides. It's pretty amazing. This is the big deal uh, on Boreas Pass Railroad Day. It's the Denver Brass, which was founded by Chuck and Kathy Brannigan. Uh, they both met because they were tuba players way back when. They don't play anymore. 
but they bring the Denver Brass, which Kathy manages, along with the Celtic Colorado bagpipers and drums. They play for about 90 minutes. Uh, John Philip Sousa, Classics, America the Beautiful, Amazing Grace, those kinds of things. And I'm telling you, it's incredible. They do it in the roundhouse because the second year we did it, uh, the weather turned south on us. And they came in from the turntable and in inside. And amazingly, it wasn't designed for this, but the acoustics are fantastic. And they just decided, let's not worry about the weather anymore. They do it in the roundhouse. It starts at 2.30. And I tell folks, even if you don't care about Como Railroad history, come for the concert. It's free and it's incredible. So here we are going back into the day or no, maybe, maybe, we're, no, no, that's right. Yeah, that's a current picture. Here's Klondike Kate on the Gunnison, Maine. And for you guys, the Denver Narragage Convention, you know the dates on September 2nd, we're having a, an open house just for the convention attendees. That'll be Saturday, September 2nd. If you are rolling through Como before that, you're welcome to stop in. Um, I'm given in this clinic, this presentation um, at the convention. I'll do it twice. And I think I'm going to get Wednesday and Thursday so I can be up there Friday to help prep the grounds and everything for the big day on Saturday. But if you're rolling through there Wednesday, Thursday or Friday, uh, the gates will be open. Come on in and take a look around. This is our motto, having fun, getting stuff done. These are our two websites. If you care to look at the pictures and the information, Denver South Park Pacific Historical Society, just the, just the letters, uh, .org and southparkrail.org. And folks, that concludes my presentation.